Okay, great. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As you all know, the COVID crisis has led to the cancellation of many of our conferences. This week, we would normally have been celebrating diversity and also attending our WNS national meeting. So in that spirit, would highlight some of the key lectures from our own Cornell students and faculty. After each lecture, we'll do a short Q&A, so you can go ahead and raise your hand and chime in at that time. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roger Hartle, who, as you all know, is a professor of neurosurgery and the director of spinal surgery and neurotrauma here at Cornell. In addition to pioneering minimally invasive surgery, he has really dedicated his career to improving neurosurgical care in developing countries. <clears throat> Back in 2008, he founded the Wild Cornell Medicine Neurosurgery Mission in Tanzania, which he has since cultivated into a truly incredible transcontinental collaboration to build sustainable care. He had numerous WNS lectures planned, including his talk today on spine surgery in Africa, which we are really delighted to hear about. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Hartle. Rupa, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome everybody this morning. Uh, as you know, we, as a neurosurgery group, we have a lot of activities going on for global neurosurgery. We have uh, the project in Tanzania. Caitlin Hoffman has been very involved in that, and she's spearheading our work on epilepsy and pediatric surgery now in Tanzania. We have Babaka, who's going to Senegal. I think Ted does some work in Central America. What I want to do today is I want to talk to you a little bit about the spinal trauma work that we have been doing in Tanzania over the last 10, 12 years. Just as a geographic refresher, Tanzania is a country in, uh, in East Africa. It's a very poor country. It's not the poorest country, but it is pretty poor in terms of the GDP, the economy, about 50 million people. Now there are about 12 or 13 neurosurgeons. When we started uh, 12 years ago, there were only about three neurosurgeons. And the neurosurgical center is really located here on the coast in Dar es Salaam. And it's housed by the orthopedic group called the Mumbili Orthopedic Institute, MOI. I'm just mentioning that because that name will come up a few times over the course of this talk. Now we have established over the last 12 years a global neurosurgery presence in Tanzania that's really based on the uh, lessons that we have learned over 12 years. Initially, we would go over there once a year, twice a year, bring a lot of equipment, and we learned very quickly that that didn't really make a lot of sense because things break down, there's nobody there to repair it, and it didn't have a lasting impact. So how, do you, how can you maximize your footprint while really only being there one, one, one week a year? And we realized that for us, what worked really well was obviously to go there once a year, operate, teach, and train. We started organizing regional neurotrauma courses once a year that happened during that same time when we were there during that week, and then the rest of the week we teach and train in the operating room. We were able to obtain funding, and these are really um, things that are funded through patient donations, uh, that we can use to have Tanzanian, promising Tanzanian surgeons come to New York for observerships. We've had eight fellows so far. We always also have funding now for a neurosurgical fellow from North America or from Europe who we can fund for one full year to go to Tanzania, live there, work there, teach there, operate, and help us uh, keep everything together. And that has been extremely successful over the last four or five years with a number of fellows, some of them you know. Uh, we realized that one way to really work together very productively with those surgeons is to establish uh, research projects. Uh, we have, that's the most painful part, we have every week we have Skype calls early in the morning on a Tuesday, but that's really the glue that keeps that project together. And then finally, we work with our Tanzanian colleagues, we put together publications, and that really makes them uh, proud and they're they're happy to do that and, and that goes in both directions that, again one of those things that keeps us all working together These are some of the fellows Maria Santos who was a pediatric a neurosurgery fellow here years ago with Mark and uh, Andreas Leidinger one of the fellows from Europe who went over to Tanzania for one year And this is one of the Tanzanian fellows who came to New York Now I told you we've been doing these courses once a year now for the last six or seven years and uh, Phil obviously has been extremely supportive and he's been uh, with us many times now and he, I think he enjoys, enjoys coming with us and he's been teaching 
here in the operating room, Jaffet, how to take out a brain tumor. And I know that those surgeons over there greatly value our contribution and our teaching over the years. So the mission now, instead of bringing over equipment, is really focused on teaching and training and conducting research. Again, this is uh, Maria Santos who was over there and she published a really nice paper on infant hydrocephalus together with our Tanzanian surgeons uh, that was uh, uh, very well received. Now, um, we, we published a number of papers over the years that, are, as I mentioned, that's a very important part of the project. Again, that brings, uh, that makes the Tanzanian surgeons, uh, gives them a, se a sense of importance and, and they learn from that. And it's obviously good from an academic uh, standpoint for us. One of the important papers that we published early on was really the pattern of neurosurgical disorders in Tanzania, where we looked at different hospitals and we were trying to figure out, well, what are really the neurosurgical diseases that are relevant in this country at this point? And what we came up with was, it was clearly a head trauma, head injury, and spinal trauma, spinal infections, so POTS disease, TB, congenital malformations, and hydrocephalus. Those were really the most prevalent neurosurgical diseases. Of course, they have brain tumors, they have all types of things, but a lot of these things they can't even diagnose because they don't have the right imaging. So we realized that if we want to make a difference, we, we really have to focus on, on, on some of these disease entities. And, and for obvious reasons, my interest was neurotrauma, so we picked head trauma, but then also spinal trauma. And this is just uh, the example of one of the first cases that I treated when I went over there. That's a patient with a traumatic dislocation between C1 and C2, where we did an uh, occipital cervical fusion with donated instrumentation. That was done about 12 years ago. And then this is just uh, a, a, a very common case <clears throat> that we see all the time, a, a thoracolumbar burst fracture that's being treated with instrumentation from the back here. So we started a spinal trauma study because we wanted to know, well, how many patients are there with spinal trauma? Where do they come from? Where do they go? How many of these patients really undergo surgery? This was done between 2015 and 2017. This was done in conjunction with some of the fellows who went over there and then with local surgeons, obviously, at, at Moy, who helped, helped us gather the data. So we implemented a prospective database that was a... Uh, you know, sheets of paper that were filled out for every patient and then entered into an Excel sheet. We used, uh, we used the Asia, Asia uh, classification for spinal cord injury for spinal trauma. And I want to share some of those results with you. This has been published. So over those uh, two or three years, we collected 180 patients with spinal trauma. As you would expect, a lot of those patients were young males and the, the mechanism of injury was motor vehicle accidents, and falls primarily, as you would expect from a society where there's a tremendous increase in the number of vehicles and motorcycles and so forth uh, on the street, on the roads. The catchment area was interesting. Uh, the Moy is in Dar es Salaam here on the, uh, on the East Coast, but patients came really from all over Tanzania. And the average travel, tra uh, travel distance was about 280 kilometers. It took them about six days to come to the hospital on average. And once they were in the hospital, the average time in the hospital was 33 days. Now, uh, here we're looking at all patients and split them up in those who had surgery and those who didn't have surgery. If you look at the surgery patients here, about 40% of the 180 patients had surgery. And there were significant differences in terms of outcomes between patients who had surgery and those who didn't have surgery. First of all, the mortality was higher in those patients who didn't have surgery. The rate of neurological improvement was higher in patients who underwent surgery. And in terms of hospitalization, patients who had surgery stayed in the hospital on average longer. As I mentioned, 40% of patients had surgery. The average time overall to surgery was 33 days. No patient had surgery within 24 hours of uh, injury. If you look at the, surgery, the injury type, complete versus incomplete injuries, about 45% uh, of patients with complete spinal cord injury had surgery versus only 36% of those patients with incomplete, which makes you wonder because usually the ones that you want to save are the ones with incomplete injuries. So you would think more of those patients would undergo surgery. So there were a lot of really interesting uh, results. Now, if you compare... The, the Asia grade on admission to the Asia grade on discharge in patients who didn't have surgery, 
in those patients who had surgery, you can see that even patients who come in with an Asia A improved to a certain extent, about 4% of non-operative patients improved, but the ones who had surgery actually about 12 or 13% of those patients with Asia A even have improvement at discharge. Asia B patients, 14% of those, of those without surgery improved, but about 32% of uh, patients who have surgery improved uh, with Asia B. In Asia C, the difference was even more dramatic, about 67% uh, of patients uh, with Asia C improved with surgery versus only about 27%. Uh, who didn't undergo surgery. So there were the significant differences in those patients who had surgery versus who didn't have surgery. Now we tried to look at some of the factors that, uh, that were influential in, in determining if somebody had surgery or when they had surgery and their outcome. If you look at somebody, uh, the, the decision to perform an operation was really based primarily on the AO spine classification, which is really a radiographic a description of the injury. So it, it grades the, uh, the uh, severity of, of, of a spinal trauma based on radiographic findings. And the ones who had more severe radiographic findings uh, were more likely to have surgery. The time to surgery, however, was really related to the insurance status. Uh, patients who had private insurance were, were better at, you know, the way that things work in Tanzania is, is you have to pay for your own instrumentation. So the ones who were wealthy had private insurance, they could pay for the, for the instrumentation and were more likely to do that and have uh, surgery sooner. And then the improvement in Asia grade, in neurological improvement, was really related to time to surgery and whether or not those patients had surgery. So that was really, really interesting and has not really been shown to that extent in the literature before. Now let's look at the costs. The costs are very, uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, and this is just really, Kind of get, get you a sense. I told you uh, there was a slide in the beginning that said the average salary is about seventy to eighty dollars a month. Now a medical school in Tanzania is seventy dollars, right? Um, and then uh, a CAT scan or an MRI scan is about seventy to ninety dollars. And uh, private patients were more likely to have surgery compared to public patients because they could afford surgery, and they were, as we showed, as we saw before, they were likely to have surgery sooner. Now, we, we know that there's a relationship uh, between uh, time of operative intervention and neurological improvement, even though that relationship in Western country has been very, very difficult to really prove because most patients already have surgery relatively early. The current recommendation now, uh, based on the St uh, Steska's uh, recommendations, is to have surgery within 24 hours in patients with an incomplete cervical uh, trauma. Uh, so, so what we find in Tanzania obviously goes along those lines, but, but that difference is also true not only in 24 hours. In our case, it is true, uh, you know, even weeks after trauma. So the early, even if you can cut it down from a few weeks to just a few days, there's still a significant benefit for the patient. And that's really what uh, then uh, Scott Zuckerman showed in the follow-up study. That, that is the study that is shown here. He looked, the only the, he looked from 2016 to 2019, so he expanded the number of patients that we looked at, and he looked only at the patients who had surgery. So 97 patients underwent surgery. There were four types of surgeries that were done. And um, again, patients have to pay for the instrumentation in Tanzania, which leads to delays and which also leads sometimes to under, surgically undertreating these patients because you may not have enough medical schools available to do long segment fixation or treat the fracture that the way that we may treat it in, in North America or in Europe. So, so Scott, in, in looking at his data and looking at time to surgery, time to the operating room, he also found that the sole predictor of neurological improvement was faster time to the operating room. Each day taken earlier offered a 4% increased odds of neurological improvement. Now this, uh, this is also published by now this study, and this is uh, one of our residents uh, years ago operating in, in Tanzania with uh, the Tanzanian surgeons. Now, we're working on a cost-effectiveness study because it is obviously true that if you look at the costs for operative treatment based on the implant costs, based on the surgery, the costs are much higher, but is, uh, is it really cost-effective, especially in a place like Tanzania, to, to treat these patients surgically 
where implants are very important and patients are in general very poor. Now these are preliminary results, but if you look at the cost effectiveness and you look, look at the cost per daily, so the cost per disability adjusted life years, so that's an amount of money that you have to pay in order to avoid losing one healthy year of life to that particular disease process. You can see if you look at these different types of interventions here that surgery for uh, uh, trauma, for spinal trauma is cost effective. It's about as cost effective as hydrocephalus treatment or cesarean section in low or middle income uh, countries. Now we're still working on this with the statistician, but uh, these are pretty uh, preliminary results, but I think these are really fascinating and really important for, uh, for what we do as neurosurgeons. Now, um, uh, finally, I just want to talk to you about uh, the next project that we're working on and that we started working on, and that is obvious, that's implementation of the spine trauma protocol, because currently, or up, up to six months ago, there was no spinal trauma protocol available. So uh, we started implementing this protocol, focusing on incomplete injuries, trying to really get these patients with incomplete trauma to the operating room pretty quickly. And, um, and, and the ones who have no injury or they are neurologically intact or have a complete injury, not focusing on those treatment, uh, on those patients. And the preliminary results, and this is just looking at uh, uh, time to surgery, the preliminary results showed that Patients uh, who uh, can, can now come to the hospital with spinal trauma are being rushed to the operating room within a few days. And that was only possible really by getting the neurosurgeons and the orthopedic surgeons on board accepting this protocol. This was also possible by getting donations from companies for spinal implants so that the patients don't really have to pay for those anymore. Uh, but we haven't we haven't looked at the uh, uh, the uh, neurological outcome in these patients. But if you look at the time to surgery, we cut it down from 24 to 2.1 days for patient for all patients, and for incomplete spinal cord injury, only to 1.8 days. Finally, I, I, I want to thank. Uh, so this is ongoing work. I want to uh, thank obviously uh, Dr. Steve, who's been extremely instrumental in supporting this and really pushing this forward. Hal Manget, who was a neurointensivist here, who's still very involved, and then the various individuals listed here in Tanzania and at, at Cornell. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rupa. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartle. So we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Okay, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. It's great to hear the work that's been done here. So now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce one of our very own medical students, Sergio Guadi. Sergio received his BA in Cognitive Science at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also graduated magna cum laude. He then completed a post-baccalaureate pre-med program at Johns Hopkins and joined the class of 2022 here at Weill Cornell Medicine. He has since been working in Dr. Swedan's lab, which he joined in 2018, and has received funding by the Clinical and Translational Science Center here at Cornell. Today, he's going to share his ongoing work identifying promising therapeutics for the treatment of diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. Sergio? All right, thank you, Dr. Yudani. Okay, let me just get the presentation. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Dujani, and um, everyone else for allowing me this opportunity to talk a little bit about my research uh, at the Sodan Lab. So um, I'll be talking about identifying synergistic combinations with CDK4-6 inhibitor pavlociclib for H3K27M DIPG. So as a lot of you guys probably know, um, DIPG is a subset of diffuse midline gliomas, which is a pretty devastating um, pediatric brainstem tumor with a median survival of about 10 months. And the five-year mortality for this is close to 99%. So it really is a devastating diagnosis for kids when they get it. Um, but what about DIPG makes it such a challenging tumor in the first place? So for one, surgery is typically not possible on this tumor because of its location in the ponds and its close proximity to uh, structures important for vital life functions, such as respiration. And also, radiation therapy is the mainstay of treatment, and it offers about a three-month survival benefit. But Regardless, tumor invariably recurs after. The other thing with DIPG is that the blood-brain barrier remains relatively intact, 
So it's difficult to really get any chemotherapeutics into the CNS. And what happens is you end up having to ramp up the doses that you give, and then you run into a lot of uh, systemic side effects in doing so. But what about DIPG possibly makes it susceptible to treatment? And so one thing we know about it is that it has an aberrant genome. And specifically, it has this missense mutation of a lysine from a thionine on histone 3 in the majority of cases. And this is thought to drive dysregulated transcription and eventually uh, tumorigenicity. And there are existing therapies out there currently that target this dysregulated transcription in DIPG, and they've been shown to be effective in vitro, in vivo, and some in clinical, some have started clinical trials. I'll talk a little bit about them in the next slide. The other thing we know about DIPG uh, is actually true of a lot of other cancers is that there's dysregulation of the cell cycle. But specifically with DIPG, we know that in these mutant cases, um, there are gains in the CDK4 and 6 proteins in the cell cycle pathway. So what ends up happening, if you look to the figure on the right, is that increase of these, uh, this activity here leads to increased phosphorylation of RB, which then separates it from the transcription factor E2F, and you get continuous cell cycle progression and eventually tumor proliferation. So one of the thing, one of the compounds out there uh, that addresses this is palbociclib, and that's an orally active CDK4-6 inhibitor. It inhibits cell growth by preventing this phosphorylation of RB and really dampening down this cell cycle dysregulation. So based on these two concepts, uh, the hypotheses in, the, in our lab were twofold. One, was that palbociclib would inhibit DIPG cell growth uh, in vitro, but that two, using these two pathways in concert, one, the epigenome, and two, the cell cycle dysregulation, we would uh, be able to produce synergistic growth inhibition of DIPG cells. So the first thing we did was a literature review of those compounds out there that would be promising to pair up with palbociclib. And so a little bit about how they work in the epigenome. So first, this, um, this missense mutation leads to hypomethylation of the histones, which then leads to increased transcriptional activation of proteins important for oncogenesis. So these, several of these compounds try to remedy this. One way is through histone deacetylations. Um, so panabinistat is an HDAC inhibitor and it works by increasing histone acetylation, opening the chromatin structure, and then leading to increased uh, methylation downstream. And this serves to partially rescue the hypomethylated phenotype we see in the histones in these cases. Another way to go about it is by uh, inhibiting histone demethylases. So GSKJ4 is a compound that works by inhibiting JMJD3, which is a histone demethylase, and it allows more methylation of the histones. A third way of doing this is by working on the bromodomain proteins. So the bromodomain proteins co-localize with acetylated portions of the chromatin and they lead to upregulated transcription of oncogenic proteins. So JQ1 is a compound that inhibits this process. And another way, sorry, I think some of this might be blocked off, but another way is that EZH2 inhibitors alter the function of the PRC2 or polychrome recessive complex that methylates the histones. So out of these suites of compounds, um, we chose panabinistat, GSKJ4, and JQ1 to use in our initial screens uh, with the eventual um, aim of pairing them up with palbociclib in a combination therapy. So, but first we wanted to validate these compounds in our lab as monotherapies, and we did so by using cell viability assays in four well-established DIPG cell lines, and these are human-derived, and you can see them listed there. And then after that, we moved on to combination therapy using the most promising uh, monotherapeutic agents. Um, and the way we really assessed the, the efficacy of using combinations here was to use a well-validated uh, method in the literature of uh, calculating combination indices. And so any combination index value that we were able to attain less than one indicated synergism between combinations of compounds. And so here are the results of the single compound screening. Uh, I'm showing you some dose response curves here. Uh, one for palbociclib, panabinistat, and GSKJ4. So the y-axis represents percent cell viability, and the x-axis shows the concentration of the compound. 
And from here, the dotted line represents the concentration of the compound at which, at which we were able to attain 50% uh, cell death. And we did this in four cell lines. We did it in triplicate and then re repeated the experiments three times just to make sure we were getting consistent results. And you can see here that we get good potency from each of these compounds. And specifically for panabinostat, we're getting potency in the nanomolar range. And this table just shows those GI50 values here um, for each of the compounds. And these closely match uh, what, are, what is in the literature. So from here, we decided to initially pair pavlocyclib with panabinostat because it was showing this nanomolar range potency. And the way we did this is shown here. Pavlocyclib was fixed at several fixed doses there. And for each of those fixed doses, we added panabinostat in a range from one to 40 nanomolar. And we did this for two of the DIPG cell lines. And the results um, do indicate that there is synergy between both of these compounds for DIPG cells. Um, and this, I'm showing you a combination index plot on the right here. So any value that's plotted below this dotted line is a combination index of one. And as I mentioned earlier, this indicates synergy between two compounds. Um, and specifically, we're seeing uh, consistent synergy when, pa when panabinostat is used between 10 and 40 nanomolar in combination with each fixed dose of pavlocyclib. And again, we did this in the other DIPG cell line as well. And so based on this, we're also doing some preliminary combination screening with, with other compounds. Notably, we're doing this with GSKJ4, and this is in a similar manner to how we did with panabinostat. And again, using the combination index plot, we see that there is synergy between, you know, pavlocyclib and this epigenetic therapy, GSKJ4. And on this graph on the left, this is basically showing that for each fixed dose of pavlocyclib, when you add GSKJ4, you have uh, increased uh, growth uh, inhibition of DIPG cells. And again, this is synergistic. So what are the things that we can conclude from the results of this ongoing work? So one, that using pavlocyclib and using HDAC inhibitors like panabinostat yields potent synergistic growth inhibition of DIPG cells. But also more generally, that targeting the cell cycle dysregulation in DIPG in concert with the aberrant epigenome seems to be a promising therapeutic strategy uh, moving forward. So future work is going to focus on, one, doing aminoblot assays to really identify what is the mechanism of crosstalk between these two pathways, and two, we want to translate uh, these results to in vivo models, such as orthotopic xenograft mouse models of DIPG. And specifically, we want to use convection-enhanced delivery, because this will allow us to get the highest concentration of compounds that we can uh, in directly into the tumor sites while avoiding a lot of systemic toxicities. And this is uh, particularly important for pavlocyclib and panabinostat because they have noted difficulties of crossing the blood-brain barrier. So this would allow us to really make sure we're getting as much of those compounds as possible into where they're supposed to go, into the tumor sites. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, thanks to Dr. Swadan, thanks for Nadia, Damane, and other members of the lab. And special thanks to Dr. Chen Kiang for some very helpful uh, collaboration on this project. Thank you, Sergio. That was great. We'll open it up to any questions. I have a question. Can you hear yes, me? Sir. Yes. Hi, it's Ted Schwartz. That was, that was a really nice talk. I enjoyed that. Um, when you talk about synergy between two drugs, and, and this is not sort of in my wheelhouse, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you add two drugs together, you can have a, a one plus one equals two model, or you could have a one plus one equals three model. And what I mean by that is if you give one drug and let's say you get a 10% reduction in growth rate, whatever your, your outcome metric is, and another drug by itself gives you another 10%, you put them together, mm -hmm. you get 20%. You could imagine a scenario where you put them together and you get 30%, where there, there really is synergy in a way that it's not just additive, but it, mm -hmm. they enhance each other. Were you able to quantify um, the, 
the efficacy of each drug by itself and see if any combination gave you more than just an additive effect of two drugs, but where they actually did more than, than just one plus one equals two. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's exactly right. So ah, the, the all right, way, good. Yeah, the way Got we it. do that is through these combination indices. So as you see there, anything that would be equal to one would just be like an additive effect like you were talking about. Got 10 it. Plus 10 equals 20. Um, if it was greater than one, then it would be an antagonistic effect. If it was less than one, it would be synergistic like you were talking about. Great, great. Yeah, you were all over it. I just was probably asleep during that first slide. So thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, this is Mike Kaplan. I have another question. Um, that was a very nice presentation. M my question is that, you know, so you're, these drugs are largely targeting aspects of the cell cycle. And obviously that is somewhat influenced by how the cells are, are cycling, right, and growing. And so my questions are twofold. Number one, have you guys looked at any other cell lines as say controls to see is this something particularly effective for DIPG or will you get the same results with basically any cell line that's growing in culture? And B, um, you know, if you're gonna use this for conviction enhanced delivery, obviously you're gonna have limited windows. So you're gonna hope that during the exposure time in vivo, the majority of the cells are gonna be in a state that'll be uh, amenable to this. So in terms of the way the cells grow in culture versus the way they grow in vivo, have you thought about that and how translatable this will be uh, based on that? Yeah, so for the first question, um, we haven't used like, for example, astrocytes as control or other glioma lines. Um, that, that has been done in the literature before um, for each of these compounds as monotherapies and it's shown that you know, it hasn't really harmed those control lines, but, you know, we will be incorporating them um, in our screens going forward. That's a good point. And uh, in regards to CED, we have done work, uh, particularly Umberto here in, in Swedane's lab, with using panabinostat in vivo, um, and it seems to work, you know, via CED, and it seems to work uh, pretty well in increasing survival. Just follow up. Thank you, Sergio. Just to follow up on Dr. Cabot's question uh, with respect to the lines. So you were talking about uh, different types of tumors, but specifically, you know, how you chose your the established cell lines versus patient drive lines. And do you think that those established lines are representative genomically? Yes. Yeah, so these are actually patient derived uh, DIPG cell lines that have been used uh, previously in the literature. Um, the thing with these, these are all post radiation. It's difficult to really get any sort of treatment naive cells because uh, of the current status of getting these um, uh, via biopsies, but these are all patient derived um, cell lines. Okay, thank you so much, Sergio. We appreciate you coming here today. Oh, thank uh, you. If there aren't any more questions, We'll move on to our final lecture of the day. So those were WNS lectures that were planned. Uh, now we are gonna turn to the diversity week portion. So I'm very proud to introduce our very own resident, Dr. Benjamin Hartley. Ben, as you all know, attended the University of Oregon for undergrad and did Teach for America, which ignited his passion for healthcare disparities. He then went to medical school at SUNY Downstate where he volunteered to serve the local indigenous population there in Brooklyn. He co-founded PRIMES in 2018 with Dr. Hoffman here to combat the healthcare education diversity gap. And he's really dedicated a lot of his time as a resident to this incredible effort. So we're delighted to hear about his progress. Ben? Thanks a lot, Rupa. Um, let's share my screen. Okay, so thanks a lot for having me. Uh, today, as Rupa mentioned, I'm gonna talk about uh, PRIMES, which is a mentorship program that I developed with Caitlin Hoffman uh, two years ago. So briefly, the impetus for our project and this program lies in some pretty alarming statistics, namely that in 2015, only about 11% of med school graduates in this country were black or Latino. 
Uh, importantly, those numbers have been the exact same since 1974. So in now almost 45 years or longer, literally nothing has changed uh, despite a lot of efforts. Also, uh, black medical school applicants are accepted at a much lower rate uh, than all of their peers. So from this came our mission, which is to reduce what we call the healthcare education diversity gap through our targeted mentorship program that matches current residents or medical students with pre-medical students of color. So the first step in our process was to ask, what is it that makes the best medical student school applicant? What does it take to get into medical school? So the AAMC's answer to that question lies in this diagram they gave us. These are the 36 factors that make up uh, the excellent medical school applicant. At the center are traditional metrics you're probably familiar with, like your MCAT scores, your grades, but they also include more nebulous factors, such as political and world events the applicant may be involved in, their citizenship, uh, their faith, intellectual curiosity, and other things. So our next step was to ask, was to hold a series of focus groups in which we asked underrepresented minority students of all ages, what are your barriers and challenges to reaching those AAMC benchmarks and becoming the best medical school applicant you can be? So we transcribed all of the results and after a quantitative uh, analysis of all of, those, uh, app, uh, all of those students' responses, we found that um, the majority of their barriers and challenges to reaching their goals were resource-based, but also they had uh, a large chunk of them were experience, skill, and knowledge-based. Also importantly, um, the vast majority of those barriers and challenges were either modifiable or surmountable. So this means that we can actually do something about them. They're things that we can change um, if we target them appropriately. So from that data, we designed our program. It looks very much like a secondary school um, year-long syllabus for a class. It's grouped into units, which are in turn grouped by their common elements. Each unit is broken down into objectives, and those objectives are in turn based directly on those AAMC holistic benchmarks. There's about 11 objectives or so for each unit. Each objective then has a goal or, or a few goals assigned to it. And those goals aim to overcome the barriers and challenges, excuse me, to reaching those benchmarks. The way we know if our mentees have reached those goals are with the assessment items that are attached to the goal. And we use those ass assessment items to generate the data that's important and really vital for our program. We group them in comprehensive assessments to assess them before the program and then after, the, after their intervention to make sure that they've improved uh, towards meeting that goal. And lastly, the objectives each have a lesson attached to them. And those are usually in an individual format for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session, uh, usually PowerPoint format, but we also have group sessions and they all have resources, connections, et cetera, associated with them. So after we had the program designed, we started recruitment for our first uh, pilot cohort. So in our first group, we had about 130 participants uh, initially apply. Only 17 of those completed our comprehensive pre-assessment that established their baseline uh, readiness for medical school based on all those metrics I mentioned. Uh, very importantly, um, well, first I should say that in cycle two, which we're in now, we had over 500 applicants uh, for our second cycle. So we've expanded quite a bit already. But importantly, we only had 17 potential mentors express interest. We recruited initially just in the med school population of the medical student population here at Cornell, and only 11 of those completed training. So this was our big bottleneck in our first cohort to getting the numbers we wanted um, in primes. So after we recruited everyone, we could then kick off the program. So the program consists of, at its core, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions between mentor and mentee. They're roughly weekly. They cover a few objectives over about one hour for each session. We also have group sessions with the entire cohort that are led by experts. We have a service project that's a long-term durable project that enhances their candidacy in a variety of ways. We offer a variety of resources. Besides just the curriculum, we also have a wardrobe fund. We offer stipends for mentees, access to experts, tours of facilities, and professional connections, and a variety of other resources. We assist them with scheduling for their meetings. Uh, we have a robust 
and targeted data tracking paradigm that's extremely important for our program. And also we've been awarded the Healthcare Disparities uh, AOC designation. So med students can um, uh, declare primes as their capstone project. Um, and we have one completed their project already and two more underway. I also briefly want to shout out Sergio who gave the last presentation. Uh, he is one of our uh, first mentee mentors to sign up uh, for the second cycle. So thanks a lot, Sergio. Um, I also though now want to focus on the data tracking because this is really the novel or most novel piece of primes that allows us to really be targeted in our approach and really have a data oriented model that we use, which really hasn't been done before, uh, really a mentoring period, but also especially to attack this problem. So speaking of um, the data, we organize it in what's called our data tracker. It's kind of a lot of numbers here, but basically um, when a mentee joins Primes, they're given a comprehensive assessment with all of our assessment items for all of those objectives. And we enter it into the tracker here. So here's those six units. We actually canceled the last unit or re redistributed it. But if you click on, for example, life skills here, um, it expands and you can see that this unit one is divided into those nine objectives I mentioned. And all these numbers here are the mentees are here on the left side. Their names are hidden for privacy. But if you look at this top mentee, for example, you can see that for this first objective in the life skills unit, you know, for goal setting and checklist creation, they're in the red. So this color code means the red is they have not mastered that objective. Yellow means they're borderline and green means they have mastered it. In the objectives, it's actually white instead of green, but you get the idea. So for this mentee here, you know, they have not mastered this objective, but for this objective, how to make their CV, they're doing very well. So when you're meeting with this mentee, you know where to focus your efforts and where you can kind of just double check that they're on the right track still. And this is how we target our curriculum to maximize all of our statistics for all of our mentees to make them all the best applicant they can be and maximize their success in getting into medical school. So for the pilot program, which finished last year, um, I guess at the start of this year, uh, our data shows the pre-assessment score and then their post-assessment where they're reassessed after the intervention, which is the mentoring. Um, so you can see that of the nine mentees that completed our program, they had, uh, they had noticeable improvements in all of the units and all of the objectives. However, due to mentee attrition and compliance with our assessments, we we're only able to establish statistical significance in the first unit, which is life skills, arguably one of the most important units, um, but they improved by about 11 and a half percentage points on average. Um, importantly also, we'll notice the attitudes and perspectives unit, they had the least amount of improvement there and it was also not statistically significant. This uh, will come important later on in our modification, but some of these attitudes and perspectives are actually not modifiable, we found, and are things that are deep-seated and can't really be changed with the mentorship program, which I'll mention a little later. So based on the analysis of those results, we modified our program in a variety of ways uh, going into cycle two, which we're in now. So some of the limitations in that pilot were our assessment frequency. We assessed them way too much. We did it every week, and it was just assessment overload. It was too much extra busy work for them to do. Um, the commuting distance was prohibitive. We initially asked all of our mentors and mentees to commute across the city to meet one-on-one, -on -one, which just wasn't really feasible with everyone's busy schedules. And we didn't have uh, a robust training uh, for the mentors in our first pilot, so that hindered us a little. We didn't have a formalized way for the mentors and mentees to communicate with each other or us on the leadership team. We suffered from low mentor recruitment and also mentee retention uh, with the dropouts we had. So the solutions to those programs we came up with after uh, uh, some intensive discussions and analysis of this, will be transitioned to unit assessments. So now we only assess them every couple months on the whole unit itself. Uh, we have a virtual mentoring model we've transitioned to so they can meet without commuting in to meet each other. This has also been very helpful actually during the coronavirus crisis. So really Prime's functioning hasn't really been affected that much because of this, because um, the med students are all at home as are the uh, college students, and they can still meet with each other just as they did before. We developed a comprehensive mentor training curriculum, so all of our ment mentors are well trained to deliver our curriculum and materials. We established the Prime's leadership team that meets once a week with about nine or ten in, uh, invested parties to help run our program. 
we expanded the mentor pool to include residents at Cornell and Columbia. So in cycle two, we, we increased from 11 mentors last year to now we have uh, 41 mentors because of that uh, expansion. And also we've established frequent and open lines of communication between all invested and participating parties in primes. Some other improvements and additions we have, we redesigned all of our objective lessons based on which ones worked and which ones did not to improve uh, our mentees mastery of each objective. We established a board of directors for our eventual application for nonprofit status. We have a Prime's development team who developed software solutions for us now for our various issues. We have a wardrobe fund and a lot of other different bodies that help with our program's maintenance. We established a branding and promotional campaign to help get the word out and increase participation. We also developed the Prime's alumni network to help uh, keep track of our uh, graduates from the program. So lastly, for our future directions, uh, this year we were awarded both the Engage Cornell Opportunity Grant and the Will Cornell Dean's Diversity Award Grant. So with this, these funds, we're establishing a two-year program manager position, likely through the Graduate School of Education via stipend. This will be important because I'm going back to operating full-time in June, and I won't have time to run this program full-time. So this person is going to help you know, keep the program going and help with our expansion. We're going to analyze our Prime Cycle 2 data. So we have now 41 pairs or 82 app, uh, participants instead of 11 in our previous cycle. So this will greatly increase our study's power uh, when we're publishing and, and analyzing those results of cycle two. And we'll glean a lot more insights from the data. We we're planning a national expansion imminently. So we're gonna utilize that virtual mentoring model to reach all medical schools and undergraduate institutions. Based on our initial number crunching, we could probably reach you know, thousands of mentors um, and, and college students in this country as early as um, by the end of this summer. We're automating all of our data collection pipeline. So we have a team of computer scientists working currently to design solutions to this issue and help us uh, maximize the efficiency in our expansion. And we've also uh, started developing what's called Primes HS, which is a virtual high school prep program for underrepresented high school students um, that are interested in medical careers. So currently our, our Primes only targets first and second year college students, but this will expand our mentee pool to high school as well. So that's where we stand now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'll take any questions if you guys have them. Thanks, Ben, that was awesome. I have a question. Yeah. Do you have any data from students from the first cycle in regards to how they're doing? Did anybody gain admission to medical school? I don't know how close they were. Yeah, so that's a good question. So our, our primary outcome for this study is uh, matriculation to med school. However, most of our mentees were first year students. So they're not gonna matriculate for, for three years from then. Um, and so, yeah, we have to wait. So I think the first cohort is gonna be applying uh, at the end of, uh, sorry, they'll be applying next year. So we have to wait to get the primary outcome. However, our, inter our secondary metrics, our secondary outcomes, are technically internal, which is just how they improved on our metrics we have, but they're all externally valid because they're all based directly on AAMC objectives. Like we didn't make these up. We just said, you know, AAMC, what do we need to do to get into med school? And then we graded our students on how well they're meeting those goals. So we do see these, these secondary objectives and secondary metrics uh, are all improving well. So we anticipate our primary outcomes will be uh, positive. Ben, congratulations. This work is really great. It sounds like it's expanded exponentially in a very short period yeah. of time. Um, so, you know, I was interested in when we were talking about your outcome measures, if you'll also be longitudinally following these students, not only after they matriculate into medical school, but also having some way to monitor their success in medical school and what kind of choices they make, because it seems like instituting mentorship like this so early on would really have profound impacts long term and it'd be great to show that yeah definitely um that is one of the main impetuses of establishing the alumni network so we use this to we kind of incentivize our mentees to maintain contact with our program by um and we have resources for the alumni for instance test prep and things like that to keep them engaged with us so we can keep track of them and uh, that is a whole separate problem, but a very important one that once they get in, you know, are they ready? Are they going to actually graduate from medical school? So we keep track of everyone and we plan in the future to, you know, that's going to be, you know, seven years from now, but we're definitely going to plan to keep track of them all the way through and, uh, you know, to do future studies to see if our interventions now, you know, got them ready uh, 
uh, with the skills they need to, to actually be successful in school. That's a very good point. Great, thank you, Ben. So thank, thank you so much to Dr. Hartle and Sergio and Ben for joining us today and giving these really, really tremendous lectures. It's, it's great to see everyone virtually and to be able to connect and, and recognize the, the amazing work that's being done here. Great. Right. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Guys, we'll have Journal Club uh, immediately after, so we'll see you there.